Sometimes we like the narrative, we like to hear the Israelites leaving Egypt or King David and Goliath, but you know, Yah here is, is saying, no, look, pay attention, pay attention to these priestly robes, there's something really significant in them. And we've looked at them in the past on how um, in Ephesians 6 with the spiritual armour, how they relate to, to, the, to the priestly armour of, of, of that time. But today we're going to have a little look at um, so something a little bit different. We're going to look at the colours um, within the, within the priestly garment. And this here, this was the um, this was the coronation, wasn't it? Um, or, or, or sorry, this was the this was the robes um, for for Aaron to be coronated into the position and for the priests. So what we're going to do is we're going to pay a little bit of attention on the colours, really, because the red was actually made by um, something called the crimson worm. The crimson worm. We're going to be having a look at this because for the. For those who haven't heard it, this is absolutely incredible, the Crimson Worm. And I've just got this little statement here. In biblical times, the red dye excreted from the Crimson Worm was used in the high priest's robe and probably for the red dye used on the ram skins to create the covering of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Uses of this red dye continue today. The worm's body and shell, while still red, are attached to the tree and scraped off and used to make what is called royal red dye so you can you can people actually like have farms of this and you'll put them on the trees and then you'll go around and you'll they'll, they'll create this red dye and and um it's this royal red dye and it's how they used to dye the um all the different robes and within this there's this there's a beautiful picture because um we're going to look at the life the life cycle of this crimson worm and if anyone's seen any pictures online this it's, it doesn't really look like a worm it looks more like a beetle or a grub it looks it, and it attaches itself to the tree and this is the life cycle um and it all points to yeshua on the cross when the female crimson worm is ready to lay her eggs which happens only once in her life she climbs up a tree or a fence and attaches herself to it with her body attached to the wood a hard crimson shell forms. It is a shell so hard and so secured to the wood that it can only be removed by tearing apart the body, which will kill the worm. The female worms would lay eggs under her body, under the protective shell, and when the larvae, larvae hatch, they remain under the mother's protective shell so that the baby worms can feed on the living body of the mother's worms for three days. After three days, the mother worm dies and her body excretes a crimson or scarlet dye that stains the wood of which she is attached and also her baby worms. The baby worms remain crimson colored for their entire lives. Thereby, they are identified as crimson worms. On day four, the tail of the mother's worm pulls up into her head, forming a heart-shaped body that is no longer crimson, but has turned into a snow-white wax that looks like a patch of wool on, a, on the tree or on the fence. It then begins to flake off and drop to the ground, looking like snow. So we see the priestly garments and the dyed, the dyed red auntie with this crimson worm, the very dye of the robes, what the priests are wearing have the crucifixion story within them. Let's have a look at some parallels, okay, with this crimson worm and Yeshua, Jesus Christ, on the cross. The crimson worm attaches herself to a tree for the love of her children, okay? That's parallel number one. Yeshua willingly allowed himself to be attached to a tree for the love of his children. How do we know that he willingly attached himself? 1 John 3, 16. And um, by this, we know what is love. Yeshua laid down his life for us and, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You see, it wasn't nails that was holding Yeshua on the cross. It was love. You know, Yeshua could have called down 12 legion of angels at any time and just got off the cross, but he didn't, did he? He laid his life down. He had a willing heart as we was looking at earlier. And in Galatians chapter one, verse four, it says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our Father. Okay, so it was it, it was the will, the will was always there to do it. And here's another parale parallel. Just as the mother worm attaching herself to a tree is part of God's design for the worm's life cycle, it was a part of God's plan 
to send his son to be attached to a tree, a wooden cross to die for us. So this, this worm was always designed to be attached to this tree and if it would have been pulled off, it would have died. And it's the exact same way with Yeshua. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life, a set-apart life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from before the beginning of time to show his grace through Christ Jesus. So the purpose of this worm, it's almost the same as Yeshua. It was his purpose all along. The mother, the mother worm, when crushed, excretes a crimson scarlet dye that both covers the baby worms and stains or marks them. What do we see? We see Jesus in the scripture. He was bruised. He was crushed for our iniquities. We know the scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 53, a prophecy, verse 5. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us a peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. What did the larvae do? They fed off the mother, didn't they? And they was made, they was brought to life by the sacrifice of their mother. His scourgings and the nails that were driven into his hands and feet brought forth crimson, scarlet blood that washes away our sins and marks us as his own, just like the larvae. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over all the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and what? and washed us from our sins with his own blood. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, having been brought near by the blood of Christ. Just as the baby worm is dependent on her mother to shield and to mark it with crimson when the baby worm is to come to life, a repentant sinner must depend on the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to receive new life and to be marked as his home. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation exists in no one else, for there is no other name under the heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, without spot or blemish. It's all there, isn't it? It's there in the crimson worm. After the mother has sacrificed herself, she turns into a white wax color that looks like wool on the tree and then begins to flake off and fall to the ground, looking like snow. Okay, what's the parallel? The manna. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a brilliant one. I didn't think of that, that's good. Yeah, come, the, the manna from the heaven I've got here. The worm turns white like the white linen garments of the priest, as we've just read. We just read that the white linen garments was designed for the priests. The worms, what happens to the worms then? Well, the worm, the worm children, the larvae, they grow up to be adult worms and they repeat the same process, the same life cycle, don't they? They attach themselves to a tree, they sacrifice for the children and then they're made white, like the linen garments of the priests. And that's how we are to take up our own cross, like Yeshua, and what are we rewarded with at the end? What do we see in Revelation? What are we rewarded with once we lay our life down daily, taking up the cross daily? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory. Give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was given clothing of fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. So just as we must be a daily sacrifice and like the worm sacrificed and turned white, what's our reward? It's the white linen, the white linen robes, isn't it? And come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's all about becoming a set apart bride. This is what it's all about, a priest for God. Let's go back to Revelation again, where we're up to in the book now. Chaos is about to ensue. What do we see in Revelation? The angels saying, do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we, have, until we shall have sealed the servants of God on, uh, on their foreheads. 
So before any destruction can take place, a seal must take place on their foreheads. What have we just read? What have we just read to do with the priests? Holiness, Holiness on the Lord, on the turban, in the white garments. The worm is not only a picture of our Messiah, but a picture of our walk of picking up the cross daily, being like Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to each other's interests. Let this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The sacrifice, that's what, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. What do we get in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46? If you're still not sold on the crimson worm, what do we see in scripture? We get this powerful scripture. I remember first hearing this on the Passion of Christ. I, I don't even think I've read my Bible at this point. And the scripture goes like this. It's Yeshua on the cross and it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatachinini. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Wow. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I remember the first time hearing that. I was like, wow. You know, this is real. Is, is, is Yeshua, is Jesus giving up on the cross here? He's saying, God, why are you forsaken me? You know, it, what, it, this is what he's saying on the cross. I remember feeling so heavy when I read this. And people was mocking him at the time, saying he's trying to call upon Elijah. You know, he was mocking him. But when you start to understand the scriptures, when you start interpreting the scriptures, we actually see even on the cross, he was being a rabbi. Even on the cross, he was being a teacher because he was trying to drop a hint to everyone listening. Why? Because he's actually quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. And this was opened up. This, this Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before. A thousand years before his, his, his crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my words of groaning? I cry out by day, oh my God, but you do not answer. And by night, but I, do, I have no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. You, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were set free. They trust in you and we're not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They snare and shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him since he delights in him. Hallelujah. I'd love to read on, but we're short on time. So read that one in your, in your private time. But as you can probably figure by now, he says, I am a worm and not a man. I am the crimson worm. The, the common Hebrew word for worm is rimmer and it is defined in, in scripture as maggot or a worm. And it's used in the book of Job. It's the Strong's H7415. So we get this word for maggot and worm. However, in Psalm 22 verse six, the word for worm is tola, tola, tola. And it's Strong's dictionary H8438. And what's fascinating about this word, it's the word that comes up in this Torah portion this week. It's the word we get when we're seeing the, 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 the order to put together the priestly garments. It's the word we get in Hebrew where it says about the blue, the purple and the scarlet robes. And it's that same word, this word tola. Defines the word, uh, it defines the word as the crimson worm. In the Blue Letter Bible, its definition can mean scarlet or worm. The same Hebrew word tola comes up in our Parsha. And it's just, it's just incredible. He was the crimson worm. He was the sacrifice on the cross. And he was trying to say to them, only if you knew, if only you had ears to hear and eyes to see. Forgive them, Father for they don't know what they've done. And Exodus 38, verse 23, this is where we see it. And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ashiamach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer, a weaver of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine linen. It's the same word that we just see in Psalm 22. Even down to the dye of the priests, 
their, their garments had symbolism, symbolism and typology of Yeshua. Every single detail matters. In this crimson worm, we find a hidden meaning of biblical significance of the priestly robes, all pointing to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua. These priests was just the shadow of the greater priest to come. God is in creation. The worm has been designed to represent crucifixion, a hat tip from the creator. The psalm was written and prophesied a thousand years before Yeshua was on the cross. And as it is written, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. You can't deny God in creation.